The following is a conversation. It has the features of any conversation, such as imperfectly expressed thoughts, ill-considered opinions, and the notions of several sleep-deprived brains. Try not to get your stethoscope in a twist about it. Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Code Podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews. By students, for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcode.com. Welcome back to the Short Coat Podcast, the show that gives you an inside look at medical school and the students drinking from that fire hose. It's a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Etler. With me today in the SCP studio, a rare and precious crew of med student podcasters. Say hello to the extraordinary M2 Matt Angleton. Howdy. The uniquely prized uh, M2 Happy Kumar. Hi. The seldom heard Jacob Lamb. Hello. And the exotically plumed Levi Doyle. <laughs> hey there. I, <laughs> you guys are like, I mean, you guys are like a post-operative visit with a surgeon. A, a radiologist with a tan, like a like a orthopedist who can only bench fifty pounds, <laughs> <laughs> like an ugly cosmetic surgeon. <laughs> I really love all of these compliments. They're I funny. mean, <laughs> just so unusual. <laughs> and I'm Thanks. and I'm so glad to have you here with me on the show today. And shortcuts. If you thought that was it was just us on the show today, you'd be very, very, very wrong. You should be ashamed of yourselves because we're joined <laughs> by Rachel Barron of Global Genes. Say hello, Rachel. Hi there. This is an organization dedicated to eliminating the burdens and challenges of rare diseases for patients and families. Thank you for joining us. And say hello to Dow Tran, M4 medical student who has been participating in a program offered by Global Genes called Rare Compassion, which matches interested medical students with patients experiencing rare genetic conditions. A welcome to the show, a Dow. Thank you. Hello. Rachel, I want to start by start off with finding out a little bit about the Rare Compassion program. What is it? What's the goal? Yeah. So the Rare Compassion program is an eight month long program in where we pair medical students or really just any healthcare professionals to individuals and families living with a rare disease. And so throughout the course of the program, the students match with multiple different patients. They have a chance to learn a bit more about rare diseases. You know, there's somewhere upwards of 10,000 rare diseases known in the world. But in your formal medical studies curriculum, you're not going to learn a whole lot about them. You have a lot to learn and it's just briefly touched on in the genetic curriculum. And so this is a chance to dive in deeper and get some more education on the rare diseases that exist. The ultimate goal is to kind of help build better compassion understanding on the part of future medical professionals for those living with a rare condition, ultimately hoping to inspire careers in rare disease and also lead to faster time to and better accuracy of diagnosis. So you say building compassion. I mean, I, I, I think we sort of already feel like practitioners and, and, and medical students <clears throat> have sort of an inbuilt compassion. So what is it specifically that that the program is concerned about? I think that you're exactly correct, right? If you're going into medical school, you you have a level of compassion and care for others, and that's probably why you're you're wanting to go into medicine to help others, right? But I think that also for those living with a rare disease, that compassion isn't always seen because they go through a very long diagnostic odyssey. A lot of times when they go into a hospital with symptoms, they are not believed and they go multiple years without receiving a diagnosis, without being believed. They're told it's all in their head. They get sent for a psych workup and so they can be really frustrated. And so it's kind of teaching both sides, both the students and also those living with a rare condition, effective communication skills to be able to partner together. Rare patients tend to be sometimes more knowledgeable in their condition than the practitioner that they're seeing simply because they've done a lot of background research on their own as a result of not being believed. And so being able to go into that conversation and, and have a practitioner say, you know, I I, I don't know exactly what you're dealing with or what we're seeing here, but I'm willing to work with you and and help figure it out together as a team. One of the things I always think of is the thing that they're often told, which is, you know, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. And this sounds like a bit of a complication of that idea. 
Yeah, we actually, in the rare disease world, it's a very common saying of, you know, when you hear hoofbeats, think zebra, not horses, right? Because generally you're going to think horses, but there are definitely those folks out there that, that are the zebras. And as an individual level, each rare disease is rare, right? It affects less than 200,000 people worldwide. However, there are, you know, 10,000 rare diseases known in the world. And so collectively as a whole, there are a lot of people in this world that are living with a rare condition. And so the likelihood of someone practicing medicine encountering someone living with a rare disease is pretty much guaranteed. Yeah. So being able to kind of recognize some of the, the signs that, okay, maybe this is a zebra that I'm looking at is something that we're hoping that students will learn through the program. You guys have heard this phrase before. I think that I think the real idea is probably like we're going to rule out some of the more common, more likely things before we jump to, you know, something that is just statistically unlikely. But yeah, that does put some patients in a bind. I mean, there's 30, if I remember correctly, 30 million U.S. patients with one of the 7,000 or so rare diseases. So, yes, Rachel's right. You're going to run into these these patients who don't readily fit that aphorism. I think one of the hard parts as well, at least like from where we are right now in our curriculum, is it's so easy to order like certain labs and certain tests for pretty cheap, but then all of the rare diseases that we've learned about so far, like if they require genetic testing, that's a lot of time and a lot of money that people don't necessarily like spending and want to spend and insurance isn't super fond of it either. It just makes it really challenging, like from a purely like ordering standpoint to be like, okay, let's worry about these, I guess, rare diseases when it could be explained by other things. But at the end of the day, going back to like what you were saying about, you know, patients getting frustrated. I'm sure the doctors just get frustrated as well, being like, I don't know how to solve this person's problem. And I kind of worry that a lot of them give up instead of continuing to try, which leads to that like clash between the two, like the patient and the provider. Yeah, I, I think that that's absolutely correct. But I would also say that, you know, there is value in not giving up, right? The, the patient themselves is living with with these symptoms and, and with the condition and, and whatever pain it's causing on a daily basis. And so I oh, think it can be really yeah. discouraging to to see that their if their physician is giving up on them, but they're, you know, still trying to find the answers. And, it, and it's definitely a a challenge with, you know, insurance and not wanting to cover the cost of a lot of those things as well. That's actually something that we're talking about at an upcoming health equity summit that we're putting on through Global Genes. And, and that's also part of the, the the goal of the program too, is it's not just for the students to learn about rare diseases, but it's also for the patients to have a better understanding of some of the challenges that physicians run into, practitioners run into as well on their end, where they might, you know, want to try and, and help to the best of their ability, but based on how the system works, it can be limiting. So Rachel, how does the program pair students and patients with families? So everyone applies and little tip here, anyone that applies, you kind of automatically get in as long as you're willing to put forth the time and effort required of the program. Same thing goes for the individuals living with a rare disease. And then once we get all the applications, we pair people based on um, language, a spoken chosen language first, and then geography, and then other factors, including disease area of interest, amongst other things. But usually it kind of narrows down based on the language preference in the geographic region. It is a virtual program. So we require you to speak via Zoom or on the phone with your patients. But we try and pair based on geography and because there are cases where students and the patients live kind of nearby each other. And I've heard of people electing to meet up in person. And I've, I've heard a lot of stories of the students and the patients kind of continuing their relationship long past the program and continuing to kind of stay in each other's lives. Because I think the other value of this program is that, okay, yes, you're going to learn all about rare diseases. You're going to learn about the diagnosis. You're going to learn the quality of life and different treatments and the different challenges and barriers that they face. But you're also going to learn that, you know, these are people first. And whether you're living with a rare condition or not, you still have the same hopes and dreams and desires and goals as any other human on this planet, you also just have this added challenge of having to deal with a, a life altering condition. And so, yeah, I think, you know, Dow can talk a little bit more to that experience from a personal level, but that's kind of how the process works. Well, Dow, tell us about your experience. Now you've been through the program, I think twice. Sure, yeah. yeah. Tell us, tell us about your experience with the, with the patients you've met. Yeah. So the reason why I even joined Rare Compassion was that curiosity of mine of, 
you know, how do I approach someone living with a rare condition? So that was the reason I joined. And from my experience, I've gotten more than what I could ever imagine in terms of just learning how to understand someone from their own perspective of lifestyle while being in medicine. So I would say like the thing that really threads between all the conversations that I've had is like being able to fight for whatever your patient is really trying to vie for. Even if you're frustrated, not giving up on that and knowing that we as future doctors might not see whatever it is that this patient might have or know exactly what we can do for them. Just knowing that there are ways that we can still advocate, ways that we can reach out and find resources. I think that was the biggest lesson for me. And then just to listen to the patient, like we were talking before, it's a lot of pressure for someone to come in and talk about their own vulnerable experiences and to not be acknowledged or to not be understood. That's almost almost as painful as not knowing what you may have. So I think from my experience, it's basically being comfortable enough with knowing what I don't know, but still being able to reach out and say, here's what we can do as a next step. Can I jump in there too and just tag off on that? I think that, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, doctors being compassionate people at their core, which is true. And I think that one thing that can maybe be a hurdle, you know, you go through this rigorous course load and you have to go through all these certifications, right, to get to where you are. So you feel like you have to know, you have to know everything. You have to be the expert in the space. And so it can be you know, probably shocking to you and make you feel a little bit uncomfortable if you like encounter something that you don't know and you don't necessarily want to be the one to, to like admit that, right? Because you're supposed to be the expert. You're supposed to be the doctor. You're supposed to know. But I think if you're able to be vulnerable with them, you know, show them that you're you're also human, right? That they, they recognize that you're also human, that you have all this knowledge. You've been through the school. You have the certifications. But like, you're also, you know, going to encounter situations where you just like don't quite know what the next step is. And to be able to say that and admit that, I think, especially with rare disease individuals, goes a, a really long way and it will help just build that trust. And I think that there's going to be a level of respect that's achieved through that. So in terms of just kind of like rare diseases that like we've learned like in class and in lecture, I feel like a lot of these rare diseases are essentially just kind of like footnotes in our textbook. We don't really spend a lot of time on them, not because they're not important, but because there's a lot of just basic things that we need to learn as like future medical providers about the human body that like it's hard to fit in every single little thing. And, and we should and we should say you guys are M2s. I mean, you guys yeah. are early on in this journey. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, right. And like, I'm just thinking like, you know, past like residency, if I'm an attending and if there's a disease that not a lot of people had, as in like maybe none of my patients in residency had and maybe it was barely touched upon in medical school and now one of my patients has it. And then along with it, because not a lot of people have it, there's not a lot of research on it. There's not a lot of funding for it. We don't really know anything about the treatment for it or the prognosis of it. And I would honestly feel terrible because I don't really know how to help this patient. And I feel like it's a very difficult and kind of unfortunate position for everyone simply just because like there's not really a lot that I can do except for potentially read up on it and just hope that like there is enough research or funding for it to me to learn about it so I can help my patient. We had a talk last year where some people with different disabilities came in to talk kind of about their health care and how how it's like to interact with providers. And they mentioned that a lot of times they will know more about themselves than the provider. Like even if it's like a relatively common disease, they know certain things like how well they can move, what they can and can't do. And so kind of finding that spot where the doctor is not the person in the room that's the most knowledgeable can be a hard spot, especially when we're dealing with rare cases. We just like don't know how to respond as well. Sounds like you all need to go through the rare compassion program. <laughs> I was going to say, can I answer to that of like going through that experience myself Yeah, about five times now? <laughs> yeah, please do. 
<laughs> and then even more in, in my clerkship as well. <laughs> so absolutely, there is that, you know, scary feeling of like, I'm not sure what this is. And then when you speak to your partners or your patients and they tell you what they know and you can learn so much from them. And even if you're, you're not the person who knew everything at first or you're not the specialist, there's a lot of ways that you can give resources. So for instance, there's quite a few Facebook groups that are support groups. I didn't really consider this, but that's something that some families or patients might like to have just because in the groups they can find a lot of solutions themselves and who says like we can't go to those maybe not the facebook group but maybe <laughs> some of those support groups and ask for their permission to join and then one last thing i want to add is that in one of the discussions we had with the students in the compassion program someone had related how they had helped their attending understand like what condition their patient had. And I was like, wow, like not only are you learning, but you're <laughs> educating everyone else around you. It sounds to me like you may not be able to fix your patient, right? I think in that case, your job might be to help them look for a path forward. Yeah, exactly. And and I also think, you know, one of the things you might learn from this program is that you have to look at rare a little bit differently because a lot of these conditions, they're they're not going to have treatments, right? They're not curable. And even if they have a treatment, it's more of a symptom management, but they can they can drastically change the quality of your life. So this is seen in some conditions where, you know, for example, a family has a child, their child gets diagnosed with a rare disease at say 11 or 12, and then they get on, they get put on a treatment. And so then that treatment kind of slows the progression of their disease. It helps them manage their disease. But a lot of the, especially if it's like neuro involvement, a lot of the neurodegeneration has already happened. They're not gonna be able to get that ability back, right? Whatever they've lost is kind of gone. But then if the family has another, elects to have another child, they will be able to test that. They're most likely going to test that child right away for that genetic condition. And they'll probably get that diagnosis much sooner. They'll be able to get that child on treatment much sooner. And we've seen this in families where like the second child that has gotten on treatment much sooner just you know, has more success, hits more developmental milestones, like thrives a little bit more because they were able to get on that treatment sooner. So it's not to say that you shouldn't be thinking about treatments and you shouldn't be trying to like find solutions to the symptom management because it, it definitely is life changing if they're able to get on those treatments early. Makes sense. Short Coats, we love to hear from you no matter what it's about. So call us at 347 Short CT with questions, shower thoughts, complaints about your situation, whatever you like. We'll talk about it on the show. When you speak to a lot of individuals living with rare diseases, first of all, they're going to say that they're an individual living with a rare condition. They're not a patient and, and they'll consider it a chronic illness because it, it is a lifelong thing. So you're exactly right that you're looking for ways to kind of help them move forward. And, you know, there's something that Happy said where there's nothing I can really do besides read up on it. But that, that goes a huge, that's a really long way. Like that is a huge thing, right? Like, yes, they're not going to walk in the room with this rare condition. You're going to be like, oh yeah, I know everything about that condition. There's like no way for anybody to know everything about it, every condition, right? But if you are someone that's then going to be willing to like go home and read up on it or like look for patient advocacy organizations for resources, that's something that a lot of people talk about is like, I just wish that like, even if my physician was able to say, you know what, I don't really know much about this, but here are some resources you can look to, to like learn more. And I'm going to also look at those resources and try and learn more with you. Global Genes is a great resource for that. We have a, a number of partner organizations. There's a lot of organizations out there that are focused on specific diseases. So just being able to like direct them towards those resources and, and being able to say like, I'm, I'm here for you to figure it out together is so much more than you probably think it means for anybody else. It makes you kind of just think back on like, the physician patient like relationship, right? Like if you have like a patient who comes in with all these symptoms, but there's no treatment to the rare disease, like a physician can go read up on it and then later come back to the patient and offer the physician perspective on it. So you're kind of seeing this two way conversation where like the patient can talk about their own experiences in their life and what's bothering them. And the physician can learn about the patient and what's going on with them and then offer the physicians like own like knowledge and training and perspective in order to help them with that management. Yeah. As I'm hearing you all talk, it, it it's kind of making me realize 
something which I hadn't really put together before, but like medicine really is kind of a very utilitarian profession. Like we like philosophically, we do approach things like with this very utilitarian style in terms of the idea that you do the most good for the most number of people. And so I think the way that that translates to medical school is often teaching in these illness script type fashion, right? We're kind of built up as these pattern recognizing re- recognizing systems to recognize patients with hyperlipidemia or diabetes or, you know, congestive heart failure have these specific symptoms. But I think maybe what that misses is like, you know, we're teaching student doctors to approach patients with a script for how they're supposed to present We're not teaching them how to build that partnership with patients to figure out what doesn't fit that script that they have in front of them. Right. So it's sort of like, okay, now I need to disengage the pattern recognizing portion of my. Yeah. You know, my brain and just go with what I'm seeing in front of me and and sort of make a plan to to progress as best as best that we both can. Yeah, I mean. I think that the problem solving and like that, like pattern recognition is going to end up proving really good once once we become providers. And I think that kind of where that overlap will have to be is being able to, you know, ask the right questions and do all of those things like we've been taught in school, but at the same time, not make being a pattern recognizer or only like quality as a provider so being able to have the problem solving hat on and then also have the like knowledge and skill and ability to take it off and listen to the patient i mean at all times but especially when it doesn't fit that exact illness script Mm -hmm. yeah i kind of want to just echo like what these guys have been saying like they just they really just teach us like very common like the common conditions like common presentations but They don't really talk about like, oh, this person's having a heart attack, but they don't have chest pain or like, for example, like they don't have chest pain. They don't have the typical symptoms. And I think that's just something that we might have to develop on our own. Just like that's experience. Yeah. Experience. Just like how to move beyond just that common presentations, common diseases, like to be able to tackle the problems of like rare diseases that have presentations that don't fit anything that we've seen before yeah i feel like there's kind of like a good kind of middle middle ground actually for kind of like where we're learning or we 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 do learn the patterns we do learn like the illness scripts but at the same time they do teach us some mechanisms behind everything i feel like we're at least given the tools a little bit to think through why could they be feeling this set of symptoms what part of their body is kind of being abnormal yeah, I think another thing that can be tricky is if you get like most of that illness script checked off, then just based on like time constrictions and like availability, we might be like, oh, they have this disease. Let's treat them for this disease. And then all of a sudden it's a rare disease and we just wasted a bunch of time and treated them incorrectly. So, yeah, it's a tricky, tricky spot to be in. Dow, what what kinds of frustrations have patients you've interacted with expressed to you? The biggest thing would be someone who basically doesn't believe that the patient is having a certain symptom and then having any interactions with someone who just in a quote unquote gaslights someone. It's a very frustrating and difficult position to be in. And I think there's also that fear that some staff members or someone might retaliate on that if you do give them more complaint. But I mean, going through the program, I've definitely seen how we've learned how to handle some of those situations in terms of being able to validate the patient, even if we haven't seen completely what the illness script matching up to that that certain symptom that a patient might have. So I think... I imagine just validation goes a long way. Right, right. Rachel, are there other activities that are part of the program? 
Yeah. So throughout the program, we have four different meetings with students. We also have them with patients separately. And two of those meetings are we bring in expert speakers. So physicians that are working in the rare disease space or patient advocate leaders will come and speak to the students to kind of give them a bit more education. And they're, they tend to be based on certain themes. And then two of them are meet and greet. So, you know, another benefit of the program is that through this program, you're getting to meet a ton of peers and everyone is going to go off to specialize in something different. And so down the road, when you're practicing, if you encounter maybe a rare patient and you're like, oh, they need to be you know, referred to a neural specialist, or I'm not really sure what I'm seeing here. You can maybe reach out to someone that you met in the rare compassion program and say, you know, you know, hey, like, <laughs> you know, have, do you know about this? Did you ever learn about this? Right. But so there's meet and greet meetings where we kind of put everybody into breakout rooms and they have a chance to really talk to each other. So there are some kind of similar challenges that everyone with a rare condition is is facing, right? There's probably a long diagnostic odyssey. There's probably this idea of not being believed. There's probably the daily challenges that they're encountering. It's really expensive treatment. They're not able to be covered by insurance, right? There's similar kind of thematic challenges, but each patient is also going to present very differently. And so it gives students a chance to kind of learn from each other about the different conditions that they're learning about. And we also have training at the beginning of the program that's a communication training. So we work with an outside organization, Pathways to Trust, that puts on kind of a a communication initial training. And then also for any students that have completed all the requirements of the program, which is meeting with a set number of patients for a set number of hours, coming to all of the the meetings throughout the program, et cetera, you're eligible to apply for a scholarship, the David R. Cox Scholarship. So for first place, there's three winners. It's an essay competition. So you write about your experience in the program, kind of what you've learned about rare disease and how you're going to use that knowledge kind of moving forward in your career. And first place is $7,500, second place is $5,000, and third place is $2,500. Um, and then all three winners will get free registration, complimentary registration to one of our summits in person events throughout the year. We have two different summits that happen. And then the first prize winner also will receive some a travel stipend to attend the event in person. How can uh, medical students find out more about Rare Compassion? You can go to our website, globalgenes.org slash compassion. You can also email compassionprogram at globalgenes.org. And we have an interest form that we can send you that should also be linked on our website that you can fill out with your name and your email, and then you will get notified. You'll get put on our mailing list and get notified when applications go live in mid-January of this upcoming year. Great. Anything you wanted to make sure that we talked about. I would love to hear from Dow kind of what is the value to you? It's a really good time to have difficult conversations, heartfelt conversations about things that you'd be embarrassed (laughs) maybe to talk about with a patient. But if you're just one-on-one without a white coat, you can just find out what are their fears and what's going on. And that's different from what you may have when you do have your white coat on or your scrubs on. And then the other thing I want to mention too is that that really, that exposure really translates because just seeing some of the different studies that have come out about disabilities, about how doctors might not have the resources or have the time and feel like they're not the doc, they're, they're not the doctor for that patient. That has led on to a lot of disparities. And so just being part of a program like this, I think maybe a very small change, but frame of mind really does progress and, and translate into what you'll do in the future. Well, great. Thank you both for uh, coming to talk to us today about Rare Compassion. Sounds like a, sounds like a really cool program. And best of luck to you, Dow, in your, in your career search this year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having us. <laughs> yeah, you're so welcome. So it was nice talking to you all. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Shortcoats, if you're enjoying our conversation today, I'd be grateful if you'd let people know by posting a story on Instagram or Facebook or tweeting about us. And don't forget to tag us in your post. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I can, I can think of all kinds of patients that might 
feel misunderstood or marginalized in healthcare. And I think we sort of touched on a few of these people with intellectual or developmental disabilities, people who have psychiatric disorders, people who have substance abuse disorders. And I'm wondering if you guys think the model offered by Rare Compassion could work to build compassion for these people as well in the medical field. Yeah, I mean, even if it is an obvious disease or disability that there are still things as a provider that you can do to help them. If you take like the time and space to learn more about like what they need, what they want, what they want out of the relationship with you, those are all things that I feel like we can never get enough practice with. I think also the the thing I was thinking about in terms of this was it's easier to feel sympathy, I think, for somebody who has a a genetic disorder or a, a disability. But then you also have populations of people who I think, unfortunately, it's, you know, many people have a harder time sympathizing with or empathizing with. I was thinking particularly of, you know, people with substance use disorders and that, that you know, it's common for that to be stigmatized. Even medical professionals fall into that trap. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do in the Writing and Humanities program in general is is sort of get people to acknowledge that there is another part of the story that you don't know unless you seek it out. And that's why I think this model might be a good a good model for understanding those patients, you know, sort yeah. of forcing an exploration, <laughs> basically. I think just like in general, like we just need more compassion and like empathy in medicine, like. A lot of people come into medical school like they want to help people they like see the best and I think just a program like like what we just talked about or just like making sure to like make sure to keep the compassion in medicine that we originally signed up for this for yeah I I also think that like it it's really really easy to feel sympathetic for someone who has like a genetic disorder because it technically wasn't their fault and like it, it kind of saddens me that, for instance, like someone with substance abuse uh, or substance abuse issues, they don't easily get that compassion because people like want to judge them. But those same people who are judging them will, you know, have compassion for someone with a genetic disorder. But like at the same time, if like depending on your genetics, you can be easily more likely to have a substance abuse disorder simply just because that's just how your brain was like coded. I think there's another group of people who may face sort of barriers to compassion, and that is people with intellectual disabilities who age out of pediatrics. So when you're a pediatric patient, you know, and you have an intellectual disability, there's a lot of support, I think, or relatively great amount of support when you're young, when you're a pediatric patient, but then you age out of pediatrics and you're now seeing adult doctors and things like that. And, and, you know, that support might sort of evaporate because now you're an adult and, you know, the adult docs don't really know what to do with you and that sort of thing. Yeah, no, I think that's completely right. I've also worked with patients with different psychiatric conditions that I think similarly had lots of invalidating experiences with the medical field. Mm -hmm. I had one doctor over the summer, one an ER doc that said the number one rule of being an ER doctor is to love every patient that comes in. I feel like people that might be overweight or like have type 2 diabetes or have hypertension just from like lifestyle changes don't get a lot of support. I feel like there's a lot of people that can blame them for the situation they're in. And I mean, some of the blame can be on the patient, but also your job is not to care about what happened to them, you know, a lifetime ago. Your job is to care for them now. So imagine that that having that attitude might be a little freeing as well. Like, I don't have to judge people. I don't have to, you know, decide whether they're doing the right thing. I just am, have to be here for them. I mean, I mean, I could, I could offer a little bit of like a tangential perspective. Mm -hmm. I got diagnosed with ADHD, which isn't a rare disease, but and like I got, I got diagnosed right before my M two year, so I went through all of high school, all of undergrad, and a year of medical school without like knowing that I had it, even though like people told me that like I might have it and I should get it checked out because I always had attention issues. And even just, like, going to my PCP, like, before I, like, went to medical school for the first time, he told me, oh, no, you don't have ADHD because you don't fit the illness script for it. You're, you're, you're literally past the MCAT. You're going to be in medical school. You've had wonderful grades all your entire life. And, like, you know, spoiler alert, I actually do have it. 
it, it, it just kind of got masked through the years and I was told I didn't have it by my physician and that's I and like I feel like kind of when tying this back to the rare diseases or whatever it's always just kind of at the very least you should empathize with your patient be like hey I know what you're going through is difficult but here's like my line of reasoning for why I think you have what you have and if you and however you might not completely fit fit that script and maybe I should learn a little bit about a little about a little bit about what you're going through just so I can help my patients in the future also let's refer you to somebody who knows more than than i do right yeah let's <laughs> but let's explore are, this let's explore this idea referrals are so like scary for certain providers because in order to refer to somebody else you're admitting that you don't have all of the resources which can be tricky for like especially in the system that we're in now where you know we have that and we have i don't know just everything associated with it we have the burnout we have everything and so if you like refer to say a psychiatrist and they're like oh they're fine why did you waste my time but on the other side i think some of it can also be like be like i gave you, have you to i gave you a boat payment <laughs> you have to <laughs> i mean come on yeah and it's like but on the other side for like the referring doctor you have to admit that either you don't know or you don't have the resources to help them which can also be really intimidating and i think that like going back to like the the rare compassion project one of the things that can be hard is a lot of times for per- perfectionists the only options are to win or to completely give up and act like oh yeah that's fine like i didn't lose i get i I stopped beneath my attention yeah exactly and so that kind of came to my forefront which is like you know as soon as they were like oh this isn't a normal like illness script like you said you're like okay i don't care anymore like find somebody else but i can't help you rather than like admit that they don't know i don't know suck right. it up <laughs> right and like you don't know everything right and like on the- there's no way to know everything stop right. stop I, I feel like that's just needlessly boxing yourself and your patients in. right and and i feel like i mean yeah we're chasing perfection we're not gonna hit it but i do feel like like physicians if, if even if they're trying to be perfect something they should do they should at least know their limits they should know the scope of their knowledge and they should know how to give patients like the ability to find someone or look up a resource in order to kind of fill in that gap right and And you do have an ethical duty to acknowledge your limits right and and to also do something about that right whether it's learn more or pass it off to somebody else who knows things right and like and like when i went to like my pcp about like my concerns for like if i potentially have adhd or not he he brushed those underneath the rug and that was very frustrating you know like even if he referred me to like a psychiatrist and like if they did testing on me and even if they concluded that i didn't have it then at the very least, it would provide for me as a patient, like, a peace of mind. At least, you know, it would have answered that question that I've had in my mind for many years. Yeah. And it would have been able to at least move past it. And I feel like, you know, coming back to the Rare Compassion program, like, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give patient, our patients at least a little bit of peace of mind that, hey, there's someone who's listening to you and trying to make sure that you're getting through this. And we will do our best ability to get you through it. And we'll also acknowledge our limits for that, too. Yeah, I think it can also come back a lot to time where, you know, a primary care visit is normally 15 to 20 minutes. And so you get that situation where, like, sure, you told the patient that you don't have it and say, like, you didn't have ADHD and your PCP was right. Even then, they didn't answer your question. Right. They just brushed it aside. And so it's like, yeah, there are certain things that, like, Like, if I were to go in and be like, you know, I think I have cancer because, like, I feel tired, but, like, I definitely don't. I'm just, there's a lot of people that get anxious about their health. That's fine. But being able to answer those anxieties, I think, like, something that I say is I want to be able to take care of the patient and not just the disease. And just by, like, brushing things under the rug, you're not taking care of the patient at all. It might be more efficient, but it's not good care it's not well it's not really the definition of efficient to do your job 
right quickly but so, yeah it's quickly not quickly but poorly <laughs> on, on paper it's efficient because you can check that off but yeah i mean depends on that's the defini- a major issue. definition of efficient right you made you made the most amount of money in the least amount of time well i guess that's efficient. well according to mm. hospitals that's pretty efficient <laughs> right. right and 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 I mean, like, if, like if a patient came and said, "Hey, I'm feeling really tired and fatigued. I think I might have cancer." I I feel like if, if the physician's going to be compassionate, they uh, they would they would reply with, "There are. I'm really sorry you're feeling that way, um, but there are a lot of things that could lead you to be tired and fatigued. Can you please tell me why you're feeling this way?" I feel like that goes a long way. Yeah. And on the other side, like, there's also other limitations where like. You know, if I come in and say like, oh yeah, I've been, I feel tired and I've also had like a really tiny cough. Can I get like a chest MRI? The doctor should be like, no, a chest MRI is really expensive. We're going to do other things first. Yeah. You can say no in a, in a nice way, in a compassionate way. Yeah. You can answer the questions in a compassionate way and like, like exactly what Happy said, like ask them questions, get to know more. We always learn like your first step is history yeah. and your second step is physical exam and your third step is anything that will cost more money than the first two. And it's step zero is building rapport and getting to know your patient and asking them even questions that aren't related to medicine because you want to learn more about them and get them to be comfortable with you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think something that we don't necessarily acknowledge is that medicine in many sense in, in many respects is part of the customer service industry, right? So we interact with a lot of patients. We interact with the general public. And if anyone who's worked in the customer service industry before knows that not everybody in the general public is fun to work with all the time, right? And especially when they're in the hospital, that's obviously not going to be, in the majority of cases, the You're best day of, of their seeing, lives. Yeah, so, like, you know? their worst, yeah. so like, I think that as a result, it, it's natural in many ways for, you know, physicians to become cynical and jaded by interacting with people day in and day out on the worst day of their lives right but that isn't an excuse not to try and no change things and be better yeah i mean it's a a big ask to to want physicians to be perfect yeah and and perfectly compassionate all the time still it's a goal yeah yeah well that's our show happy (laughs) matt levi jacob who had to leave thanks for being on the show with me today yeah, thanks for having yeah. us. Thanks, Dave. It's always a pleasure. And what kind of utterly commonplace fool would I be if I didn't thank you, Short Coats, for making us a part of your week? If you're new and you like what you heard today, follow the show wherever fine podcasts are available, like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube. Thanks to this week's editor, Katie Hyam Kessler. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine Student Government and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities program. Our music is by Dr. Vox and Catmosphere. I'm Dave Etler saying, don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use. But the bottom line is that for what it's worth, I see you. I know you're out there. I wish I could do more. Maybe I can in ways that I don't understand yet or know about. But I see you and I'm glad you're here and other people are too. The Short Code Podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at mededmedia.com.